Kristen Clark here with PopCultureMadness.com at Voodoo Experience in New Orleans. I am here with Mr. Thomas Dolby. Could you introduce yourself to our site visitors, please? Sure. My name is Thomas Dolby, and I'm a musician and artist and songwriter. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us for a few minutes. You know, first and foremost, you know, how happy are you to be uh, taking part with Voodoo Experience this year? Is there anything we should be excited about for your performance today? Yeah, it's actually my first appearance at a festival in New Orleans. Uh, I've played here in, in uh, you know, clubs and, and other venues in the past, but this is my first festival. Uh, I've been coming here for years and I love the place. Um, really glad to see that it's, things are picking up and it's doing well now. Uh, a few surprises in store today. Uh, I have a very special guest uh, artist, Michael Doucet from Beau Soleil, is going to come up and play some fiddle with me today, uh, which is exciting. Uh, he played on a couple of songs on uh, an album of mine, and so it's nice to have him back on stage. And I'll be doing some songs from my new album, A Map of the Floating City, as well as old hits like uh, Hyperactive and She Blinded Me With Science. That's so awesome. So are we going to see any appearance from the time capsule today or no? The time capsule, which incidentally is a 1930s teardrop trailer that looks like H.G. Wells designed it, uh, is not actually in New Orleans this trip. When I was here in the spring, it was here, and it enabled fans to send messages to the future. Uh, but because we flew in this time, uh, we didn't bring the time capsule with us. It has yet to be uh, modified, so it'll actually transport itself through time and space. But that's a feature we hope to add next year. Absolutely. That's such an amazing concept. I think it's so cool. So I'm sure the fans have been eating it up. How many messages have you, you know, managed to record on that so far? I believe we're over a thousand now. Uh, we picked the best ones and put them up on a YouTube channel called Time Capsule TV. So if you want to go up uh, and, and search for it on YouTube, you can see some of the best clips. That's great. So, you know, can we talk a little bit about your most recent album? And I know you had some interesting social media concepts tied into this. You know, you also have a, a massive online multiplayer game with this. How did you come up with the concept? You know, I started making my album. It was my first in 20 years. And uh, I looked around and I thought, well, people are not actually buying albums anymore. You know, so is this pointless. But thinking back to the beginning of my career, uh, when I st first started making records, they weren't really getting played on the radio, and but MTV was just emerging then. So I basically taught myself to be a filmmaker and, and started making MTV videos, and that was really what launched my music uh, at the time. So I actually love being a newbie in a new field, and so uh, creating a game and a social media um, network was a new experience for me, but it seemed to be much more apropos as far as um, embracing a new generation of fans. And so we launched the Floating City game uh, last year, and thousands of players signed up and uh, spent a few months playing the game. And about half of them were hardcore Dolby fans, but half were just online gamers, that many of whom had not heard of my music at all. Many of them probably maybe too young to remember me from the first time around. So uh, it made sense to, uh, to you know, offer them a platform like that that would get them talking to each other and collaborating. So does the game kind of follow the story of the, of the album? So how does how it tie together? With, is there a storyline? I suppose it's just very loosely the concept around the album. Um, I do my recording, I live back in England now, and I do my recording in a converted lifeboat. Uh, in, in, I have a beach house there, and so I have a, a lifeboat in my garden facing the North Sea. And um, I have to draw the blinds in case the local botanists, you know, peek in at me. But I have a periscope in the roof of my lifeboat so I can sort of perv them on the beach. Uh, and I also use it to look at uh, massive container ships going in and out of a nearby port. And at different states of the light, sometimes they look like a floating city. And uh, so I came up with this concept of this sort of dystopian future in which uh, mankind can no longer exist on land and, and they have to push out to sea on the um, hulls of these abandoned ships. And that became the basis for the Floating City game. So, you know, honestly, taking a look at things now, how far away do you think we are from like a reality of, of that type of concept? Because sometimes it can be a little scary. Well, I mean, it's very scary. I mean, you know, we're, we're not very far away from it unless there is some um, disruptive invention or technology that changes it. I don't think we can trust governments and corporations to put us back in the right track. So the only hope we have basically is with the scientists. And scientists come up with some wacky ideas. I, I saw one guy talking at TED um, uh, saying that his recommendation was to shrink mankind down to about 10 inches tall because that way you know our resources would go a lot further than they do today and he felt he could do it in two or three generations wow oh i wish him the best of luck with that one but i don't know <laughs> be too many takers for that
No, I don't think that we're going to volunteer, but <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> so, you know, how does it feel for you personally to be kind of looked at as like a pioneer of, of electronic music and kind of a person that kind of even spearheaded this? And how do you feel about where we've gone with that today? You know, I'm not an electronic musician in terms of um, surrounding myself with knobs and dials and, and creating electronic music for the sake of it. I think when you talk about electronic music, you really talk about music that sort of glorifies the, the quirks of the machines, you know, versus organic instruments. And I'm basically a songwriter and I happen to, you know, keyboards and electronics are the sort of palette that I work from. But most of my songs I could sit and play you at a piano and they would still make sense. And that's, I think, what sets me apart from most electronic artists. Oh, absolutely. So how do you feel about the current state of, of music in general and the way that, I mean, you've obviously witnessed so many changes within the industry and you kind of took a step back for a few years from it. How do you feel about where we are now? <laughs> I think it's actually tremendously exciting. I mean, you hear a lot about the woes of the industry, the labels and so on, but, you know, we don't have to cry a tear for them, really. I think what's, in, in, what's important here is that tens of thousands of talented young artists now have no barrier between them and the public. You know, you can make an album on your laptop and you can get it up on YouTube and potentially reach millions of people. Um, so there's absolutely no reason that you have to, you know, see the industry as a barrier to you getting through. That's good and bad news. I mean, the, the good news is that, that you know, it means it's, it's going to be uh, encouraging to a lot of young talent coming, at, coming forward. The bad news is that uh, as an artist, it's kind of hard competing with 10,000 other guys that are all trying to get in the same space. But um, I'm sort of lucky because I have a foot in both camps. You know, I have something of a, of a reputation, a brand left over from the first time around. Uh, but I'm still relatively fresh in terms of my songwriting ability and performance. Absolutely. So personally, I look at music as a universal language that we can all speak and understand, even if we take different messages away. Is there anything in particular you hope your music will say to listeners? You know, I provide escapist music, really. You know, I think a lot of uh, pop music today is really about, it's in the moment, it's about where we are, it's about relationships, it's about materialism, it's about day-to-day -day events. And you look at the activity around around you know twitter and facebook or reality shows or talent shows or whatever it's very much in the here and now so i sort of buck that trend really i go against the grain because my music is very escapist you know i look for ways to paint a, a, a canvas that is um that takes you somewhere else it might be a different time and place it might be a new set of characters it might be drawing on an idiom of music you know that's un unfamiliar to me like in the new album there's there's a section called americana with a k and uh I really have no right to be making Roots American music, but I, hell, I'll try anything. <laughs> Absolutely. So what are the plans for after Voodoo Experience? Where are you headed after here? Well, from here we're going up to Asheville, North Carolina, to Moog Fest, uh, where I've been given a Moog Innovator Award, uh, which is going to be exciting. And then in theory, we're going to Washington, D.C. for one last gig and then home to the U.K., although the way things are looking, I think Hurricane Sandy might get in the way. Yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for taking a few minutes out to speak with me. Is there any, you know, final comments that you'd like to share with our site audience? <laughs> and that's it. Great talking to you. Thank you.